What's going on, everyone? It's Mitch from RespectMyRegion.com back with another episode of R- the RMR podcast, looking at music and cannabis across the map today, joined by special guests who's dabbled a little bit in both of these worlds, man. Rocka Iris Cyrus, a.k.a. Rocka Taylor. How you doing today, Rocka? Peace. I'm doing well. How about yourself? Man, I'm I'm living, you know, it, it, the weather doesn't turn cold us, on us in Seattle, so I got the fireplace running, man. But, uh, you know, just uh, adjusting to the climate out here. Uh, getting ready for that that wet time of the year. Great, great. great. Um, shit, man. I'm sorry, bro. bro. Hold on one second. We're having a problem on this side. Oh, We're gonna get it right. right. Okay, if you want to. Yeah, yeah, we good. Yeah, yeah. Let's rock, man. So you know, every every episode, I kick off with our guest um, origin story with with their passion, whether that's music and cannabis. We're gonna dabble a little bit of both sides today, but I, I'd like to start with your origin story with music when you first started. You know, turn the page on just being a listener and a fan, and started being an artist and a creator. Um, I started in church. I was a church kid. Um, PK, like if, if you know music history, the, the blues continuum, and you understand how gospel music it kind of gave birth to blues and jazz and rock and all that, and ultimately forward, you could you could find hip hop as one of the branches as well. So it gave me a, a solid base, and um, I started, uh, you know, with hip hop culture through graffiti art. And through graffiti art, I kind of found DJing. Um, that led to me uh, picking up the microphone from that side, and I ended up hooking up with Evidence. Uh, originally, just to do, do one song, but that's and um, at the time I wasn't called Ira Science. I just had my first album that never came out called Ira Science, and people just started calling me that split from my graffiti graffiti um, identity and all that so that's how the name iris and the music came about just from from being a graffiti kid that loved hip hop and you know when you when you love a good hip hop culture that's going to be rap music and that's how it came about and we've had quite the journey since then when, when did you first start getting introduced to to cannabis as as a as a consumer as a consumer, oh uh, man, high school, school sometime, like probably junior high school. Um, I was well, well. That was the first self introduced to it as a consumer. It, it was around most of my life, you know, like from cousin, family members, old uncles. You know, if, you know. I remember at one point we had like a little patch, and it's been it's been around since, as far as I can remember, but. As far as me partaking myself, it would have been junior high school, something like that, and uh, um, kind of stuck with me. So as as we started making more music and navigating the space, um, dilated. We weren't even called dilated at the time, but Evan and I uh, close and became part of the overall Soul Assassins family. Uh, it was the first one. He- give us a record deal uh, alchemist you know the producer alchemist at the time hooligans and that was evidence my partner evidence is like pretty much his best friend so you know and, and alchemist is a big part of that soul assassins family sound so we were just we were just to the soul assassins family fold and they showed a lot of love to us really early on and we still um and consider ourselves family um and through that you know tight with cypress hill and obviously we know we all know what cypress hill means to the to the cannabis community bridge that you know it it was one of the most important bridges and aspects of the connection so and kitty so yeah that's that's how i uh kind of came in contact with myself and how it, it it affected the music or how we became you know such uh music and so, you know, obviously dilated people's being being the trio, you know, yourself, evidence, 
and Babu. You know, being a creative, it, it, it can be difficult, right? Like collaboration is a big part of being a creative. Uh, you know, there's very few people that in the music realm, right, that write, produce, record, uh, engineer, do 100% everything, right? Like a lot of hip hop is built upon collaboration, but it's also can be difficult. And, and finding that ability to work with people, especially on a consistent basis, is not, it's a rare thing, right? I think anyone is created, you get in a lot of environments where it might not be the right match, the right fit, or, or you might not vibe or maybe you can vibe for the right record, but but making you know an album or a career together, it, it, it takes a lot of work kind of creatively. So how did how like soon was it? Obviously, like you said, you and evidence were already tight, but how how long did it take for you guys as a trio to kind of click on the same page? And and was it pretty smooth and pretty easy, or was it difficult at times like being having one vision as three separate creative individuals? I mean, well, well evidence and I were, were already a group for a while. We did a game before dilated people it was just the two of us um i knew babu separately i knew world famous b because i was really tight with you know rep matic and j rock and those guys over there on the on the shout out to um to the um b junkie institute of sound planet. um but yeah you know they, those were already my, my homeboys um b junkie crew i remember when babu got put in b junkies and he had a tape um, that he was called Comprehension, if I'm not mistaken. But it was like a ill, Ill mixtape, and he was just this, this kid is, is crazy. You know, he was on some. Psh. So um, we ended up just became, became friends, and ultimately, I invited him to. I you know, talked to Ev, Ev about it. You know, at the TV, if we had a dilated show, so we were working with whoever was available. So, so one night it might. Jam- Five spinning for us. It might be homicide spinning for us. It might be Rhett spinning for us, like from 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 the licks, the alcoholics. So it just just depended on who was around, who was available, because we we didn't have our own DJs. So um, we were able to you know kind of tap into the community for that. We went to the fold. Everything clicked pretty quickly. I mean, there were some a little bit of growing pains. You have a third of a new energy, like someone going scratch crazy on everything. Um, and, and so, you know, we had to figure out, but it didn't take very long. We, we knew pretty, pretty, pretty much right away that we made the right decision. Went up, the, 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 the studio sessions went crazy. Everything changed at that point. So, I mean, I mean, there's definitely, there have definitely been times where we haven't seen eye to eye. I mean, we didn't get together because we agree on everything. You know, that wasn't, you know, a prerequisite. It was just at the time sync with what we wanted to do, but you know, we don't, we're not forcing each other to to compromise. And so there are times when, you know, I don't like something, or Ev doesn't like something, or Babs doesn't like something. I counted for that by saying, all right, well, there's going to at least be one or two solo songs from everybody on each project. So you you could pick whoever you want to produce it. You could be about whatever you want it to be about. You, you know, what I mean, if you want me wise, you know, consider it. A, you know, consider it on the album. Album, if that's what you wanted, that respect that we gave each other still stands to this day. You know, um, things that really kept us tight was the fact that from the very beginning, um, you know, bad, well, from the very beginning, evidence and I knew that we wanted to do some separate types of projects. We knew that we had other things, music. Um, so it was something that if you go back and listen to our, even our earliest interviews and so on, this coming soon, that coming coming soon and that's how we've always approached it so like him you know if i haven't talked to him in a month he and i'm not even on a project he can still call me and, and say you know and i and, and vice versa if there's something i need from him he, he's always there and babu the same so back for each other as creatives as artists um we love when we do connect this dialogue that way because we built a vehicle that that's been very important but we also love and recreate creatives that inspire each other with the solo work that we do. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. And, you know, coming, coming from the West coast, right? Like, like in the nineties, obviously the West coast really carved out a little bit, you know, early, early nineties, especially on a, on a mainstream level, then the West coast really carved out a sound or kind of around the gangster rap sound. A lot of people think of West coast music. They think of those, you know, the Dre, the Snoop, the dog pound, the the derivatives of that, but obviously, yeah. California is known for 
or has a lot more to offer than just that sound. And coming from whether you want to call it the independent grind or the underground grind, the West Coast, specifically LA, kind of put a put a flag on, on the map with like a different sound, right? Coming that was different from the gangster rap sound. You guys were one of the, the people that I feel like thrived in that community, but also like broke out of that in, into the mainstream where maybe not a lot of those guys that, that had similar level talent were able to do that. What was it like coming up in LA and just like how competitive it was, even if it's a friendly level of competition, but that's like, you know, obviously New York's the Mecca of hip hop, but LA's kind of like outside of maybe the South making a case, you know, LA is kind of that next play, you know, that next place where you look at labels and infrastructure and spotlight. Um, what was it like coming up in that before you guys kind of fully broke out and everyone knew who dilated was, what, what was it like? Was it competitive? Was it love? Was it tension? What, what was that scene like? We didn't really have that much tension. Um, we were pretty comfortable with what we did. Like we were culturalists. Like, like we didn't evidence evidence and I did a rap battle or at a studio or at a concert. You know, like we met a few times. We hung out or talked. It was about graffiti. It wasn't even about music. And, and when he called me, he was like, "Yo, a bunch of people on it. I want you to jump, jump on it." you know, come to the studio to record it. And for whatever reason, came, came, I, I think, think I might've been the only person that showed up for that particular session. So yeah, I think he and, he and I just ended up doing a song together and just knocked it out that way. So, you know, our relationship, relationship with the community was really, really organic. We really want to see everybody win. Um, the cats, we never tripped about the billing or, or any of that kind of stuff. And, for the most part, I'm a little issues here and there. For the most part, everybody wanted to see us win too. They knew that we represented culture in LA and not just the rap side of it. So um, I think they, they saw that we were getting a lot of respect. Going to New York and you know chilling with Premier, Pete Rock, or the Beat Nuts. Uh, was there D and D Studios? And you know, I was at the time I was a member of Zulu Nation. At the time, Steady Crew heavily. So you know we were really on the on, on the on that space, but there were people in LA that'll still take take your head off your shoulders, man. You got people, people like Freestyle Fellowship, the whole Good Life, mm -hmm. which be, those cats are crazy. Um, the alcoholics with the with the whole Liquid Crew movement that that we also so linked in with, obviously, Soul Assassins. You know, moving between LA and you know Mugs and some of his people being from the East and um, you know Far Side. You had, you know, doing really good work. And up north, you had just like, of course, you had too short or you know, people like that, loonies, different people like that moving. You also had Dells, Souls of Mission, people up, the, you know, uh, extra prolific. You had a lot of people up in that that whole hieroglyphics movement up there, and even outside of that too, Planet Asia, and you know, it's mm. just you know, top to bottom, California is has big old cut father, rest in peace. So. It's a, it's a, it's a bunch of people that were really doing a lot of that. You know, um, one way that we kind of bridged the gap was that I give a lot of credit to evidence for this because he, you know, he has like supersonic canine dog here, every frequency of sound. So, you know, he made, made sure that, you know, we can make, make the record to pick, kick whatever we wanted to kick. But when it came down to mixing and mastering, like he would be beyond what I understood. He understood that to be a part of the science. So we would have situations where um, our records sonically could play next to Snoop or Missy Ellie or whoever the biggest rappers at the Nas, you know, Ludacris, whoever was popping at the time. At the time, our records sonically could bang with them. You know, style, if you didn't like our style, if that's one, one thing, but it wasn't like, um, there was a problem with the studio you know, having to read more kind of stuff. It just banged. And you know, we spent a lot of time making sure that was the case. Um, so that you we were going to be able to play it. And luckily for us, you know, a good amount of people liked the music and showed a lot of love for us to play, I think, I think, at a higher level than, you know, a lot of people that didn't have that, that understanding or did. But that has nothing to do with what they're doing on the microphone. Cats are deadly in, in California still. They will remove your face from your from the, from the back of your neck. You know what I mean? Like, like it'll 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 be a bad situation. If it... 
And, and obviously in this day and age, like independence and being independent is, is glorified, right? Like even artists that are not independent technically are, are bragging and busting about being independent on record. And there's this mindset with a lot of young artists that, you know, that you want to be independent because you don't want to split it with the label. Now, you guys definitely your come up was independent. And, and again, like I said, you know, in, in the time period you guys were at, we're really one of the flagship people for for underground hip hop. Again, from the outside looking in back when that kind of that term meant something, there was people out there that was like, nah, I listen to like underground hip hop, just not whatever is the mainstream shit on radio. Yeah. I don't listen to that. I listen to to the real, I guess it was kind of synonymous with that. Um, but you guys obviously got some commercial success, had videos on MTV and, and reached a level where your records were reaching people and, and you had had these deals. What was it about that that come up, that grind, some of those things that you had to go through as, as an independent artist or as like what I personally just call like the DIY grind because you don't got the budget or the, or the team to do it. You got to wear a lot of different hats. So what was it like having to wear multiple hats and how did that kind of prepare you for, you know, marketing and business and, and, and outside of music? Yeah, um, the independent situation, it was, a, it was almost came into the game. Like the the goal because there wasn't I mean we first started the internet wasn't as this thing but it didn't really impact music at all or or brands in, in that way definitely it was definitely not an alternative to to the the standard systems that we have now the one of the major labels you get major label distribution and make it work you know like and that was how the DS changed that considerably now you can record a you can write a record, beat, stir it, do the artwork, upload it, sell it, spend the money, make more, money, and do a concert all, all from your phone at this point in in, in life. You know, like you know, we came up. You know, it was definitely not the, the case. So, um, you know, we had to really understand the the space. Um, but so you know, we first came into the game. We made some noise. We, we got our first record deal uh, through Immortal Records. Recorded the album, and at the time, at, you know, in the midst of recording the album, the deal with Immortal Records came to a head. They had some issues, and we weren't happy with positioned over there anyway. So I believe it was. Yeah, I'm not even sure what year it was to be honest, but. Um, to do, I got word that uh, um, that there was an issue between Epic and Immortal through the contract, and uh, went to the library and, and translated my whole record deal contract myself. It took me a full nine, eight or nine hour day, trying to, trying to figure out what this meant, what this meant. Pulled out the unabridged, the giant unabridged dictionary. This is before I could go Google it. There was no Google anything. There was like micro film and like, like you know what I mean to find out to find answers. So I had to like like translate it by hand. Record deal, and I, I found a loophole um, where if um, lost distribution from the up label, which was seeming like it was going to happen because of their split, then thirty days, and if they didn't have new distribution already officially locked in, we just have to send it to the label. So I called, you know, about the 25th. I kept it quiet. I told Ev he was with it. And so, so I waited until about the 26th day, 27th. Then I, I went to my lawyer and was like, yo, yo, this is what I found. Like, is this real? They're like, yeah, this is what I found. Is this real? They're like, yeah, it's real. And mind you, these are people that I had already asked to get us out of the iron class. Like, there's, there's nothing that could be done. Like, I, I, at that point, I had never taken a loss of life, you know, so I just had, had the desire to figure it out. So they told me, oh, yeah, great, great work, man. You, you feel, oh, man, let's get the paperwork together. Signed the paperwork, sent it over, got released, and then I just found it. Like, you know, that was that was how, how it went. So from that point to really um, kind of look at independence differently, because we'd already gone, to, we already had it, and we knew it was all, uh, most of of it was smoke and mirrors. I mean, you can make it work, but, but a lot of it was what wasn't what we thought it was going to be. So we figured we might as well just do this our way on 
our terms. And we were able to kind of get ahead of that a little bit. ABB Records up in the Bay Area in, in Oakland Records. And that gave us like another surgeons. Once we put out those records with ABB, Elvinches, and became like really connected with a lot of DJs and, you know, they really appreciated what we were doing. It gave us a lane to kind of move into putting out independent projects. Our capital and EMI came knocking with the, um, with the decimal point and the comma in a different place where it needed, and um, we ended up doing that deal. Yeah, and and you know, obviously, I think the record that that a lot of people think you know think of you guys when it really comes to your 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 coming alive moment on a on a bigger scale is obviously worst comes to worst off the expansion team album. Was that did you guys yeah. feel it when you made that record or feel it when it was when that was initially released that like yeah this is this is one of those ones or or did you did you not quite have that feeling? No, nah, it was it was a weird situation with that record because. Um, I was up to New York uh, to work with Alchemist. And it was at that time, again, it was early. It wasn't worth like, like you want to go work with somebody, you get on a plane and you go fly out there and you go work with them, you know, like for the most part, you know, fly them out to work with you, however you want to do it. Um, we ended up going to Manhattan and we just been there all day, smoking, eating, listening to beats, smoke, eat, listen to beats. beats. And Toward the end, end, like we were almost like, yo, not hearing what, what we want to hear, like, you know, what we're looking for. Everything is just sounding good because he's a great bad. But, you know, we were, I think we were all listening for something that was like, like and, and I remember hear, hearing the record. And, and I remember Ev asking, like, yo, what's it's weird? Like, I can't quite catch it because it, it wasn't like a normal four, you know, four bar loop type of beat beat like it's like six bars and bars and a one bar, bar chorus so so it's a weird track to kind of try to catch like if, if you try to kick one of your run end up in like you got to really just lock into the, the drums if that's if that's going to be your approach to it or, which is what like ludicrous did or other people had done for the same the same loop but the way i just remember like it was a we were still a little bit no it's not like a normal kind of beat like like our dj is going to want to spin it but we just felt it you know, we recorded it i think ev is the one that came up with the 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 mob deep sound actually no i shouldn't say the mob deep sound but which came down to the um to the little snippet that, that we were a master for for the project um and uh and uh i think that became the the vibe. I think I, I wrote the first part, and then he came in. But yeah, that was that was one of those ones where you know we knew, knew it was something special about it, but we didn't know like until we recorded it. Once we recorded it, uh, uh, we recorded it that in New York, and I remember like I think it was like Primo and somebody else was there. Primo and some, but maybe Gord Dex. Like the whole D and D, I remember them coming in and being like, "Yo, if you don't release this joint, we don't even kind of think they're like, we love this shit. Like if you don't really, if you this, this isn't the one, just know you got problems like this from y'all out there. So that was we, you know, it was a joke, but it was also serious. Like that, that, that let us know that we, you know, we just felt it, and it just kind of took off by itself at that, at that point. And and how much for you guys changed, right? Because like you know that that record was with the, I think your guys' first record to hit charts. Like I said, the, the video I know was getting played on TV, and and, it, and at that point you look at the you know MTV was was your your window into into music for a lot of listeners, right? There wasn't YouTube, there wasn't Spotify, like you said, there wasn't social media. So your only way that a listener could really stumble upon a, a song is the radio, MTV you know, a show or you know, some form of thing in physical, right? Street team, whatever, like had to be physical. There was not a lot of of, of outlets or distribution channels. And, and again, from that that lane of, of hip hop, that's not necessarily on the pop rap side, you know, that that window of like when you guys came out, I think it was like you guys and like Talib and Most and maybe like Farrell Monch were really the only dudes I feel like they kind of had credibility in, in 
you know, the whether you want to call it underground, boom bap, the the real hip hop, whatever you want to, you know, box that into, but had credibility and a lot of love in that. But then you broke into like now reaching new fans, right? Your fans that are only getting force fed music from the radio to TV, right? Like they're 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 not gonna listen to anything until that tells them it's tight. Was there kind of was that kind of a tipping point of, of the music video coming out for you guys to build a, a, a bigger audience through that alone? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the worst come the worst video. Um, it did done other videos before, uh, but that one was a, that one was definitely special. You know that song we recorded half the video in L.A. and half the video um, the video the part of the video in New York. Um, or, I don't know if interesting at the word, but it, yeah, it stands out to me in my mind, you know, on a number of levels. But um, I remember it, it was like September 8th or 9th, say like something like that, probably the 9th that we shot. Uh, um, and we were waiting for Guru to show up to do his, his part. And because and, the, the idea for the video for every verse but uh, if you notice things and, and the reason there are two brooklyn bridge scenes is because we were just waiting for guru to and we ended up doing uh, uh like a version of my part just for just for just to have a take of it just to test it out um we did we shot the video um flew into into, into europe to go meet with uh, Lincoln Park. We we're gonna go mm -hmm. do this Lincoln Park. We we're gonna go open for Lincoln Park. And, and we, we flew to Europe, got to Hamburg, checked into our hotel afternoon. And you know, we're at that point, we're six hours ahead in New York or, or nine hours ahead. Um, turned on the TV as soon as we got to our rooms in, in, in Germany and, and nine building was already on fire in new york and we watched the second plane hit on uh, this is not watched the second plane hit um which you know was was crazy um obvious um what that also meant on a, on a very, very i guess practice was mtv was like we can't play this video because it has mm -hmm. the world trade center just got destroyed yesterday so you know, we ended up having a show digital. This is early too. Like nowadays, it probably wouldn't have been that big of a deal. But at, at that point, when 2000, something, what is it? What is that? 2001? 2001. 2001. Yeah. Horrible with this shit. But um, um, whatever it was, it was over, over 20 years ago. And it wasn't as easy buildings and all that stuff on the fly for a rap video. I mean, yeah, if you're making a movie and you got a budget, it's, for us to do it, it was a big deal. But um, ultimately, it came out, and the, with the delay with it coming out, with us having to go spend the money to go re, you know, you know do special effects, um, it did really well for us. You know, a, you know, a, a two other videos came out with the World Trade Center, and it, and it was no problem because by that time, like the initial shock of it, I. But yeah, that that video did a did really well for us and put us in a lot of places. Uh, made us like the, the underground rap group that was doing people's and and things like that so it was a we it put us in kind of a unique middle ground um, place and it wasn't that big of a deal i mean and like i said we started in graffiti art coming in the graffiti art scene it's not even necessarily about rap music per se i mean there's certain you know the graffiti art, art community enjoys rap music but Especially early on, even to plenty of graffiti artists that don't listen to rap music at all, they listen to metal or you know punk or red or just rock and roll, whatever soul music. Like the old cats were into Motown. It wasn't you know you could, to be honest, it might sound crazy, but you could talk to some of the older graffiti cats and they're like, they were really an element in the hip hop. You know, it's something that they grew in, in parallel to hip hop, but you know, I wasn't into all that like. I don't necessarily agree with that, but you know I can understand their position because they were there. They're hip hop. If they're saying that, you know, this has nothing to do with that, 
you know, like, so it's, but um, that kind of put us in a place where we were already networking and communicating with, you know, and, you know, punk, punk, punk rockers on that side and all kind of different people just because of how it was. So middle and to create something that kind of brings people together was, you know, wasn't strange for us. No, that's that's fire, man. That's crazy with the with the digitally editing. I I I can't imagine the technology required two decades ago to do There's that. still a man. version. To find the really that they released it on a we put out like a um DVD or like a promo tape a VHS tape. It was a long time ago. It might have been a DVD by by that time. Version with me doing the my verse in front of the World Trade Center with the tower behind me and if it's out there it just wasn't the one that got service to to uh mtv and be whoever else vh1 i guess whoever else it, it never got service to just we just put it out later kind of promo behind the scenes video hmm. I'm, I'm gonna have to check for that uh you know it makes sense like the graffiti back Ground right of being being a creative like beyond just being an artist being a, a visual artist right not just a, a lyricist um and and doing the work that you know i know we've chatted a little bit offline uh, of what you've done creatively in terms of marketing and branding and that that aspect what point did you kind of transition from just you know for music being the main hustle to starting to do um some of these creative and the branding things and and early on and i know that led into being a director of marketing at, at dna genetics having that cannabis industry crossover but but what point did you start dabbling in in those things away from doing it i'm sure you were involved in that process for the music but moving away from it from your music and starting to do it for brands and kind of other entities yeah like you said i, I was of of what i was doing for dilated it, um i ended up like like handling a lot of the management for dot coordinating merch doing most of the booking over the years like so i was kind of stepping in the side of the creative space just through dilated uh, um even though at times we had managers and agents and other things i was still kind of the if nothing else the point person in the group to make it happen um, um at, at a certain point i would say uh I don't even remember again. Point. I, um, I I kind of moved over. I decided that I was going to go back to school. I had, I had some downtime. I, could, I, I wasn't really in that space at that time. I'm like, you know, I just, just love, I'm, so I'm real spongy. I, mean, I love picking up things and trying new th things. I don't know. I get bored easily, I guess. But at the, to this day, my biggest passion was architecture. So I ended up going to school for like a year, to school. Um, and then I just, then it was time for our next tour campaign and tour at the same time. And, you know, I was, I saw straight A's start slipping into, and I started to see like the writing on the wall, like this, you know, I can, can definitely tour. And this is also early that existed at this time, but it was still not like ubiquitous, it was, but it still wasn't the thing. And it wasn't like, like today where every major school has an you know, online program or any of that kind of stuff like this was like teachers and everything else to be able to go tour and go back to school but um south africa I, I, and and try, trying to find like a, a table to hook my rulers up to so i could do this. just the whole process of finding that like i had to go to like the next building over, over and use table while they're cooking over here and steam and, and i'm trying to draw and i was just like yo this is i don't know if this is gonna off to like let go of the of the handle to swing to the other side you know uh, i'm still got years to go so and i still, still love making music and touring so i ended up switching my major um to advertising which to me at the time i looked at as the study of propaganda like it was from that standpoint like you could put out these, these creative messages um and press band how does that work you know so um i Ended up taking whatever placement test I needed to play into the the advertising program. Moved up over to advertising and ended up getting my degree in advertising. And um, through that, I started working with an agency called Cartel Creative. That was in Seoul, agency of record for Red Bull, you know, especially during the BC One, like the B Boy Championships and things like that. Uh, John Jay, 
and um, the and Charlie Shin um, through uh, through me hosting some Red Bull events, and you know talking to Charlie the time I ended up going over there working with them as as a basically like a and just kind of a project leader producer putting together other things and that kind of I really fell in love with the the puzzle like unlocking the puzzle of working on a project how to develop or or to you know to 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 foster insights and develop turn those into um strategic concepts that are that are effective almost a game you know a puzzle to me like how do we unlock this and from that point i just started working on brands i was working with cartel but i was also you know doing independent work working uh see working for before i worked with dna i had done projects for so you know i link with dna i knew aaron yarko one of the owners of, of D from elementary school like we go back to like elementary school days um he's like two years but we go back that far um we ended up meeting up years later you know um getting our medical cards in la and um he invited us down that was obviously one of our favorite places we we were getting out there as much as we could so showing amsterdam for cannabis cup so we ended up doing that at the end of that show stepping up and helping them out organizing and a few things, making some things happen. And that led to them and do the next year's Cannabis Cup party for them. And I ended up doing, I think, maybe in Amsterdam, or five or six, maybe five years in a row in Amsterdam at Melkweg at Melina, in one of the centers there. We were throwing the, the High Times DNA hotbox party every year. And I was curating the talent. I was booking it, handling, putting together the teams and everything. Even, before, even while that was all going on, I was also doing, doing projects for, you know, Weed Map, the, uh, Marley Natural, um, Restock, which is like pulp, you know, you know like um, cannabis pulp fibers and, and, and presses them into paper. So a different bunch of different projects, so multiple projects for Weed Maps, actually. Um, and uh, after that, kind of boomerang back. And DNA decided they were going to move their company to places from Amsterdam to California, and they wanted to put together a California team. So they reached out and asked if I was director of marketing. They knew I was on the brand side, marketing side, advertising board. I was doing all, all that, but they needed someone to come in and, and fill in the space of director of marketing. So it, they brought me in to do that, and uh, I had a lot of fun. They ended up canceling the the Californian it uh, um, because of uh, uh, su some supply chain issues. And we were also going at that and they were just having a bunch of issues just trying to get it untangled. Um, but that's family. Um, love those guys. I just, just talked to, to Don the other day. I got to catch up with them. Actually, excellent dudes, man, good dudes. And um, I'm really proud of what they've been able to do over the years. Um, I, I want to unpack some of, some of the stuff you said there, but I, I do have one question that stood out to me uh, when I was looking at you know the 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 company the consulting company you're operating under right now, Angles. Um, was that what, what's the direct tie? To, obviously, I know one of your early songs, you know, the early dilated songs being "Work the Angles." Is that a, Angles like a concept that's kind of been around for a long time? And, and what's what's that concept mean to you? If there if there is some ties between that? Yeah, well, um, I started another agency. Uh, uh, a couple of years back, just freelancer wanted to create a little bit of a base, and and it was a straight creative tactics agency, straight design agency, um, maybe a little naming, a little this, a little the slight. Thing. It was more straight, straight creative, creative uh, tactics. Um, I had some strategy um, seminars and checking out the world of strategy, um, the creative strategy strategy, content strategy, you know, whatever it was. Um, I ended up falling in love with, with that that um, skill set, that science, and, and that community. And 
through that, I met some really good people. So I had an agency and it wasn't called Angles. I was really feeling like I need to find like a spark. I need something to inspire me. I need something that really what I'm trying to do. And in, in talking to, you know, a friend of mine, um, he's a, he's a more uh, popular and one of the most, you know, talented and generous um, uh, strategists that, that I've met. His name is Mark Pollard. And uh, Mark, Mark has a company called Sweathead. And I was talking to Mark and, you know, what's the name of the agency? What are you doing? I explained it to him. He's it's like, yeah, that's cool. You know, good name. Like, but why? Like, why are you doing that? Like, what does that have to do with you? Like, what does that really have to do with you? Talking it through with him, he was like, you know, what would be great would be something that but to me is like, have you ever thought about angles? Like, you know, he's like, work that angles is like one of my favorite songs. You guys is a strategist, but he also comes from the world of hip hop from Australia. He had a magazine called Stealth Magazine. Even he was doing like, you know, like chat room, hip hop chat rooms and all that stuff. But now he's, you know, worldwide in demand strategist from Australia. But he's like, yo, I used to, you know, work that, that to me is, you know, that that's you. Like when I, I think of you with click angles, you know, um, and we ended up talking about that. And, you know, before we got off, he was called angles and you know, the, the whole idea behind it, or the strategy behind it, you know, and that, you know, like when you talk about boxing or playing pool or anything else, you're just finding a, a unique line of approach um, to find your way into where you're trying to get to. So it's directly tied into when, um, but, but it, it, it didn't come from me. I, I always give credit to Mark and, to, you know, the sweathead saw that in me and, you know, turned that on and, and really uh, shine the light on how, how powerful that's fire as that's fire that's how it's connected I, I figured that there was some sort of connection there uh but that that's strange you know it, it took that that outside inspiration but i like it and, and i also like that song man where the sample switches up and it is uh is pretty pretty wild man they come from the era of a lot of just loops that's where it was kind of an aggressive switch but obviously in sync on that beat man yeah i appreciate that thank you yeah record right there did, did really well for us and that really put us in a really strong scene. We were already um, doing a lot of good work on physical work to angles, and it's still something that goes off. But to your point, worst come to worst was um, introduced us, you know, introduced a lot of people, a lot of people like really built the bridge with with the masses. Um, I think it was a uh, for sure worst. Um, and then on, on the agency side, right? Like a lot of what you do is strategy, but also, you know, I, I know like listed on it, it's cultural uh, or culture consultancy. And then I know it's a lot of what we talked about and then just in other things, like how companies move with from or within or speak to culture is very like a huge component of how brands market and, and deliver messaging nowadays. And especially I'd say these days, even more than previous with, you know, even weird cpg goods that are kind of popping up right they're not using your traditional tv advertising it's a lot of stuff through TikTok. it's a lot of things through content and the way that it moves is whether it comes from culture it speaks through culture or it leverages kind of where cultural is moving right like culture is so i mean it's always been important but it seems to be more important and more brands are kind of narrowing in and understanding that from your perspective like of how to work within or speak to a culture in general, is it something that you feel like has to come? I mean, I think authenticity is obviously an important component of that, but do you think it, that a product or a brand needs to kind of surface come from the culture or there's a way for them to manufacture might not be the right word, but to kind of learn and adapt and speak to culture? Or do they really have to come through that in, in 2022? It, it's, I don't think that um, it's impossible for somebody to, to um, would be interesting to a particular culture, culture themselves. Um, I think what's important more so than where you come from the situation, if you want to speak 
to a group of people, really take the time to understand and to study that group of people, to understand that group of people, to know that people, even though you're you're considering them a group of people themselves, are, are a collection of individuals. It's not the idea of, of thought or how anybody's going to handle it. So, you know, you know you, I think it, it really, really just comes from, from a respectful place and you're solving a problem, then I don't think with, with um, selling to someone outside of whatever, I guess you could say your base culture, you know, whatever the base of your business's culture is. I think, I think it's a problem when, when control culture, um, I think it's a problem when, when people accepted into a particular culture suddenly feel like they don't have to respect that culture and then that culture. Um, but, but I don't, you know, I, I think it's, you know, there are people that'll look at something and, and, and say, hey, I like that. And it wasn't even, they were, no one was even presenting that to them. They just happened to stumble with it. So, so you know, I don't think everything that comes out and everything that happens is cultural. Really. Um, um, but I do think it's important that if, if you're going to, I guess you could say, and I don't, I don't like to use this way, target a, a particular group of people or target a culture, um, if you're going to market it to or for the purpose of trying to turn profit or make something happen, then it's, it's most, I think, very respectful of that and do your best to understand that and also to and invest the resources in communicating with people of that culture so that you possible and um, where those dots don't need to connect that directly amount of, of, of oversight or a certain amount of, of um, input into the situation because I will say that regardless of what the, the intent is or to get it wrong you know they can't afford to come out and say the, say the wrong thing and, and then try to apologize even if the hot seat, that's an expensive trip to the hot seat for them. So it makes a lot more sense for these brands to talk to a particular group of people to communicate with people from that group of people to that group of people that they want to talk to, to work with, to collaborate with, to bring in. I think that that's really what it comes down to. And I think when you do that, you end up with better, better communication, better community, community relations, because every Everyone feels like we're not just here as a market. We're not just here as spice. You know, um, you respect us as uh, in, in Canada. You know, we're not just a flavor for you to play around with and hope for the best. So, yeah, I think if, you know, that they can't afford to get it wrong and that whatever whatever community there is that they're trying to, generally speaking, from that community that they can speak to directly, they can hire as consultants. They can, they can hire us, you know, uh, contract uh, partners or whatever the case is to come, you know, they're not, not um, they, can, they can keep their foot out their mouth and um, keep themselves off the hot, even with the best of intention, saying something or doing something that they had no business saying or doing. Well, that's, that's, that's some, some jewels right there. It's, it's been a big conversation. Obviously, you know, the business of hip hop has, has, had a lot of conversation and tension around that subject over the years. Um, in the cannabis industry, we're starting to see a lot of that conversation between, you know, I always say between the suits and the cowboys, the people that were here pre-legalization and the uh, private equity groups and the funds that are coming into it, right? There's this big talk of uh, of separation between culture and business, right? And I think a lot of a lot of those companies in cannabis need to take heed to a, a lot of what you you just spilled, man. You should you should send an invoice out for them just to listen to that. Uh, <laughs> Hit the like button. I don't know what you're supposed to say in these, but whatever's happening, make sure you check check out. Keep locked into these jewels and gems. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. You know, but before I get you out of here, man, I, I got one question. I know that you, you gave me another jewel with the with the worst comes worse and the the the, the digital uh, reduction of the graphics you had to do with that. Do you have a good just like story of the come up or whether you were, you know, once you guys were on a little bit more of that was just like a real like a good grind story or like a DIY? I'm always a sucker for like you know, when people at the masses or whatever group see something and they don't understand like how 
how how much struggle or how much DIY went into something that the end product doesn't necessarily look like that, right? Do you got any good stories like that from the come up? Yeah, I mean, my classic DIY was the the issue with the contract, having to go, you know, train on myself, take that back, get us out the deal, fire everybody, and kind of take take that on my shoulder. Um, but you know, we've always kind of had that ethic, so that work ethic um i think once we got into the the 12 inch space and started really moving 12 these stores you know like from some of the the music you know the the numbers of, of units that we are moving i think that from there we were able to really that momentum you know um into relationships with dj i think that that was probably for us you know, um, one of the most important things that we could have done that still, uh, hold, you know, holds us down, you know, keep, put, keeps us in a good place that we took the time to really invest in our relationship with DJ, not just in um, in Los Angeles or California or even in the States, but around the people. Unfortunately, a lot of my, a lot of peers uh, from that era but now they wait until their their careers kind of on the decline or until the you know they push in them as hard as they want to be pushed to go try to find other markets to be relevant in and, and you know you know you're you know that you're coming at to them late for us i think the fact that you know so we made it out right away and make, make the world part of our launch if we're if, it, if it's going to be released to the world then we're going to go so i think that just that approach right there garnered us a lot of respect in the dj community hip-hop community because we you know we took our time to, to to spread that love and do what we could so um i think that just that that's what it was nowadays is is not necessarily the same you know um it's not as fraternal there's not that there's not as much um from the community there's not just one community there's multiple communities space because of what's happened and you know i guess you could say it's been decentralized um so it's, it's um but that attitude of trying to figure out you know because you make a record and, and it automatically you know seeps into people's sleep you know subconscious while they're sleeping. somebody's spinning the record somebody's at the club spinning the records or at you know concerts records put down mixtapes or you know whatever the case, whatever the the version of it is right now, putting your music out there for the people to to really lock in with it, and are some of the most important people in your in in, in your overall journey and your, your overall career appreciated, and those people are appreciated, then you're gonna you're gonna be able to pick that else of that appreciation because you appreciate them for what they do. And the fact that they're spinning the music and they appreciate this, this good music gives them something to spin, but also t t you know t tips your hat to them and of saying, hey, you could have spun anything for that three minutes, but you spun my record, so thank you. So you know this, um, in in high esteem with um, with most of the definitely the majority of hip hop DJs around the world, and those are relationships that we still have to this day. Build, yeah, building yeah those relationships and building organically, man. Yeah, that's that's the 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 grind. Obviously, it pays off. Well, Rock, I really appreciate you hopping on here and and, and giving some insight to your journey, um, dropping some jewels out there for you know for people that want some more information. Theanglesagency.com, Rock yeah. Taylor on LinkedIn. Anything else you want to plug before I get you up out of here, man? Yeah, I want to thank you. I think these these uh these pl platforms that are are connecting with people. And and you know, doing unique things like you're doing with music and cannabis and culture and creative and doing these, these things, and not being afraid to and f figure out a way to you know to help tell these stories that line up with that. So, so that's very cool. To, to the generations of new artists that have come up and that continue to come up that that appreciate it, that are trying to figure out a way to you know to always push it forward. Shout out to all the new artists to inspire generations we were inspired and that's 
that's how we were able to get the, the battery in our and you know, you know we've been blessed to to hear that we've inspired others to do the same and now the people that are inspiring other people so it, it keeps going with gen, you know generations generations uh, um will will hopefully still be locked into the culture or appreciate where it came from not feel like there's a ceiling on where it can go absolutely innovation and evolution forever man well i appreciate you rocco for hopping on here this is the rmr podcast uh you can check us out spotify apple everywhere else you listen to podcasts at we'll be back with more content later this week we are in chicago on friday this week for the kvl international flower ball and then mj bizcon in a couple weeks i hope to see some people in person that are out there live episodes at both of those occasions we'll see you guys here soon